Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to take a look at the life and career of Agnes Moorhead. You probably know her from playing Endora on the TV series Bewitched, but there's a lot more to her story. I got some cool clips, some freaky facts, and I'm going to touch on a subject that I normally skip over. She was born Agnes Robertson Moorhead, December 6, 1900 in Clinton, Massachusetts. Her mother was 17 when she had Agnes, and her father was a Presbyterian clergyman. She said that her mother was a tremendous singer, and she taught her, along with her younger sister Margaret, how to sing at a very early age. She said that I would sing all the time, anywhere and everywhere I was allowed. But when I was three years old, I had my first ever performance. It was in my father's church, and I recited the Lord's Prayer. A few years later, her family moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and this is when acting started to become part of her life. I'm at the St. Louis Muni. It's been here 103 years. Only the best performances and the best performers can take stage here. Agnes was on stage through her junior and senior years of high school. She went to Central High and graduated, and I can't show you that place because it's long gone, but she was on stage here, and it's a big deal. Now we are on the Del Mar Loop in St. Louis. If you get here, just ask somebody, they'll send you right on down. This is our St. Louis Walk of Fame. We have Agnes Moorhead and her bio. We're very proud of her. It's located right down from Vintage Vinyl, which should be a landmark itself. We have stars all the way down one side. And there's Blueberry Hill on the corner where Chuck Berry played all the time, even up until a couple years before his death. The stars are on the sidewalk all the way down, up the other side. Right over there is the statue of Chuck Berry. And then we have Fitz's root beer right here. You can go in there, check it out, see how they make root beer. They bottle it right in front of you. Yep, Agnes Moorhead. We're proud of her. In 1923, she got a job at KMOX AM Radio in St. Louis. This station was very powerful and could be picked up throughout the entire central United States all the way into Mexico and Canada. And her radio show, which she sung on, became very popular. She knew right then that she loved radio and wanted to make it her career. But she had promised her father that she would continue on with higher education. And without breaking her promise, she enrolled at Muskegon College in Ohio. Then she transferred to the University of Wisconsin where she studied and held down a job teaching English at public schools for five years. After she graduated with a master's in English, she enrolled at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and graduated with honors in 1929. Around the same time, her younger sister Margaret committed suicide at the age of 23. Now, Agnes has only spoke about this a couple times, and they were in interviews where it was brought up to her, and both times she said, I do not speak about my sister, because when I do, I cry. So now this interview is over, I need to go cry. This is when Agnes returned to stage work. She said it was very unsteady at first, and she went four days without eating one time. And that's when she decided she's got to get a full-time job. Again, she went back to radio, her first love. And she said, I was so good at it before long, I had enough work that I was doing multiple shows every day of the week. Starting in 1930, you can see over 100 radio shows that she was either a prominent cast member or the star of. Agnes starred in the original radio broadcast of Sorry Wrong Number, which was later turned into a movie starring Burt Lancaster and Barbara Stanwyck. She plays the lead character, the bedridden woman who overhears a murder plot when she gets her phone lines crossed. She's trying to get people to help, but they can't figure out who these people are or where the murder is going to take place. By the end of it, she realizes she's the intended victim. Your call, please. Operator. Operator, I'm in desperate trouble. I, I am sorry, I cannot hear you. Please speak louder. I don't dare. I, there's, there's someone listening. Can you hear me now? I am sorry. But you've got to hear me. Oh, please, please, you've got to help me. There's someone in this house, someone who's going to murder me, and you've got to get in touch with him. 
This was a huge hit, and it was also reran as a play seven different times, 1943, 44, 45, 48, 52, 57, and 1960, each time starring Agnes in the lead role. The original radio broadcast was deemed culturally and historically significant by the Library of Congress and selected for inclusion in the National Recording Registry. Orson Welles called Sorry Wrong Number the single greatest radio script ever written. He invited Agnes to join him and Joseph Cotton as charter members of his Mercury Theater. Then, on Sunday, October 30th, 1938, the Mercury Theater radio broadcast released War of the Worlds. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army. The battle which took place tonight at Grove of Mills has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. There's a video on YouTube that was filmed in like 1988 where someone interviewed the remaining AT&T phone operators from that era and they said that people were calling them because there wasn't 911 and they were begging for help like, call the army, send in the National Guard, we need help, the aliens are coming to Chicago and they were swearing they were seeing little green men and other ones said they saw a giant robot and they believed it because they heard people getting killed on the radio and the women were crying and anytime you heard a woman cry or scream on the show that was agnes and the rest of the cast they pulled it off perfectly lord to tell you the plane i'm a field caught up by the woods of fires the gas tank crash the automobiles spreading everywhere coming this way now about 20 yards to my right so what happens after you shake up the nation well you get scolded by the government of course but then Hollywood takes notice and comes in and wants to sign everybody on the show. RKO Pictures came in and offered them $100,000 to come out and make a movie. Orson Welles got to write it, direct it, and produce it. Agnes got paid $2,000 a week to star in it. It's a little movie, you may have heard of it. It's called Citizen Kane. A bank in trust for your son Charles Foster Kane until he reaches his 25th birthday, at which time... He is to come into complete possession. Charles! Go on, Mr. Thatcher. Well, don't you think I'd better meet the boy? I've got his trunk all packed. I've had it packed for a week now. The movie was nominated for nine Academy Awards, and to this day, it's still ranked as one of the greatest films ever made. Now, how do you follow that up? Well, you get the entire crew back together, and the very next year, you film and release The Magnificent Ambersons. And we could be together. How? On $8 a week, we'd be using more of your money than mine. My money? My money. <laughs> I, I've got $28. I, I know I told Jack I didn't put everything in the headlight company, but I did. Gosh. Oh, I know what you're going to do. To try and understand that it's impossible oh. for either of us to go on this way. Will you get up? I can't. <laughs> I'm too weak. When Orson Welles turned the movie into the studio, they demanded that he go back and reshoot the ending to make it happier, which he did. Then they took away all editing rights to him and trimmed out over an hour of footage. They released the movie, and it went on to be nominated for four Academy Awards. Agnes won Best Actress of the Year at the New York Film Awards. The movie was also added to the Library of Congress as one of the most culturally impactful films of all time. Now, after a few more films with RKO Pictures and the same cast and crew, MGM invited her for a screen test, which she said took over a week. They had her perform as a teenager, a grandma, a damsel in distress, a villainess, and a heroine who saves the day. 
They said she is such a versatile actress that they wanted to sign her to a contract right then. She asked if she would still be allowed to do radio. And they said, normally we would say no because we are afraid the artist will pick the wrong show and ruin their entire career. But in your case, having been on two of the biggest radio shows of all time, we're going to say yes and make the exception. So they signed her to the contract for $6,000 a week. From there, she appears in 24 movies throughout the 1940s. So if you think you've seen her in something, you did. She also was on Suspense Theater Radio, and that went for 946 episodes, and she starred in more of them than anybody else on the show. Now, before we go any farther, I need to mention this. In 1930, Agnes married John Griffith Lee, and the two of them divorced in 1952. Then she married actor Robert Gist in 1954, and they divorced in 1958 when she caught him in the act of cheating on her. Now in the 1950s, she appeared in 28 movies. She also made her first appearance on television, playing a blind woman in the Revlon Mirror Theater episode, Lullaby. Check this out. got hurt. A farmer slammed into us with his truck. Oh. Upstairs, back room. I'll call Dr. Chase. Not on to that, Mom. Hey, what about something to eat? There are three of us. Sure, I'm sure there's plenty. Fix something, will you? Sandwiches, anything. I'm going to put the car in the garage. The top's down and it feels like rain. All right, Ben. And from there, she appears in many more TV shows. And, you know, some of the cool ones, too, like The Rebel, Rawhide, The Rifleman. How about the Twilight Zone episode called The Invaders? She doesn't speak a single word the whole episode. It's freaky. Now, in 1964, she was offered the role of Endora on a new TV show called Bewitched. She checked it out. She thought this seems like it's a gimmick, kind of hokey, and she turned it down. Just a couple weeks later, when Agnes was shopping in a department store, Elizabeth Montgomery, who was also in there shopping, came up to her and introduced herself. Elizabeth said, I was so disappointed to hear that you weren't going to be on the show with us. I'm the one that recommended they ask you. I've always loved your movies and always wanted to work with you someday. Agnes said, how can I say no to that? So she went ahead and signed on as Endora. But in her contract, she had it put in there that she could only appear in 8 out of every 12 episodes made. Because she had too many other projects that she wanted to pursue. Agnes really didn't think the show would last more than one year, but it went on for eight years and Agnes appeared in 146 episodes playing Samantha's mother who doesn't really like the fact that she married a mortal and she interferes in their marriage something fierce. The more I see of Uncle Arthur, the lovelier your mother becomes. If I had to choose between the two, I'd take Andorra any day. The man has come to his senses at last. He finally appreciates the real me. And I want to thank you for your compliment, Darwin. Darren! That's right, Darwin. I have decided to move into that house on the corner. There's no house on that corner. It's a vacant lot. It was a vacant lot. Look again. Dora, 
Well, we certainly have missed you. Long time no see. Any resemblance between George Washington and myself is purely coincidental. Mother intends to live there. Over his dead body. <laughs> Darwood, dear boy. I think it's time we had a talk. I mean, I think we should have a better understanding. I just want to bury the hatchet. Where? I understand he's behaving like a petulant little boy. You may think so, Endora, but the truth is I happen to be the head of this household and I'm man enough to stand up to you. Stop, Mother! Too late! <laughs> now your appearance is caught up with your mentality. She was great on the show. No one could have played her character any better. Now, I wouldn't consider her a bad witch. She just wanted things done her way. And you better not get in her way. Unfortunately, Darren, Darwin, Durwood, <laughs> he messed up and got the wrath of her a lot. But other people got it too. Trick or treat? Don't push me, little boy. Aren't you going to give us anything? More than you bargained for if you don't run along, little fellow. <laughs> then we're going to have to trick you. I'm ready if you are. Abracadabra, you're a tree. Well, don't we look pretty? Cut the small talk. What do you got? <laughs> Looks like junk to me, mister. Bag or nothing? No dice. I'm going to have to trick you. Mix all pick it. Razz it to Mick. Tricked. You'd better watch out. Well, honey, that should be the last time. Everything's ready. Good. Uh, by the way, did you chew? <laughs> Your face. <laughs> How about my face? She said that she really enjoyed her time on the show. The whole cast and crew got along famously. Her only complaint was that she had to wake up at 4.45 a.m. so she could be getting her makeup done by 6 a.m. and on set at 7 a.m., sometimes filming all the way till 8 p.m., which left her no time to do other projects. There were rumors that she didn't like Dick Sargent, but she says that's not true. They were probably started because people found out that other than William Asher, the director, I was the only cast member that went and visited Dick York while he was in the hospital. Now, after the show ended in 1972, Agnes still appeared on television and in movies through 1974. One of these final appearances was in the movie Charlotte's Web. That's pretty cool right there. She plays the goose that gets Wilbur to speak for the first time. And Paul Lind, who's Uncle Arthur on Bewitched, played Templeton the Rat. And Agnes's best friend, Debbie Reynolds, played Charlotte. Shortly thereafter, Agnes's health started to decline very rapidly. She ended up moving back in with her mother because she couldn't care for herself. It was determined that she had inoperable uterine cancer. Sadly, on April 30th, 1974, at the age of 73, she passed away in her mother's home. Her mother continued to live there until she was 106 years old and passed away in 1990. Now, over the years, a new theory has emerged which might explain her cancer. In 1956, she filmed the movie The Conqueror with John Wayne in St. George, Utah. The filming was done on a parcel of land which is a no-go zone now. Prior to them filming there, it had been used as a nuclear test site and it's radioactive. Along with Agnes, the actors John Wayne, Susan Hayward, Pedro Armendariz, and the director Dick Powell all died of cancer. People magazine looked into this and they found that there were 220 people in the cast and crew total. By the end of 1980, 91 of them had developed some form of cancer and 46 had died of cancer. Over the years, more people have looked into it, and the numbers have increased. It seems like there really could be a connection here. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We're now going to touch on something that I don't usually talk about. 
The Sexuality of Agnes Moorhead. While doing my research, I couldn't avoid this topic. It was everywhere. Her Wikipedia page has a whole section dedicated to it. Her IMDb biography has a whole section. It's just everywhere, more so now than ever before. From what I can tell, this whole thing was started by Paul Lind, who played Uncle Arthur on Bewitched. Somewhere in the mid-70s, he was performing a stand-up comedy routine at a club in Los Angeles. During this routine, he said some jokes about people on the show, and he mentioned Agnes and said that she walked in on her husband having an affair on her, and she told him, if you can have a mistress, I can too. Now the crowd laughs, and he goes on to say a couple more lines, which are too vulgar for me to say on here, and that's kind of it. Now in the audience, there was a writer for what was back then considered the alternative press, and he took this as meaning that Agnes was going to have her own mistress, a lesbian lover, and he put this in a little periodical. Then someone references his article. Then someone references their article. Then a tabloid that you would see like in the 80s at the grocery stores, they reference the article and make a little story of it. And all this, every time, you know, it sells papers, it sells little magazines. So people kept referencing each other, but it all stemmed back to Paul Lind on stage one night making a joke. Then in 1994, a book called Hollywood Lesbians was released by Bose Hadley. And in there, he references the same Paul Lynn joke and adds Agnes Moorhead to the list. Along with Greta Garbo, which was like a shocker to a lot of people. And they're like, what? This doesn't make sense. So a little bit of things, you know, were called into question there. But the book goes on and lives on and has been referenced many times. Now fast forward to the internet age and you can see through a Google search that year after year, more and more articles are put out. Oh, and I wouldn't even call them articles, kind of like what I'm doing right now. There's videos, there's posts. It all started with Facebook groups and fan clubs, all referencing the same thing over and over to now it's 20 million page clicks or video views over something that's been titled Agnes Moorhead Lesbian. Now, while doing my research, it really opened my eyes to how the Bewitched TV show was very progressive. So, there was a large ensemble of openly gay cast members. Just think about it. Paul Lind, who played Uncle Arthur. Maurice Evans, who played Samantha's father on the show. Alice Ghostly, who played Esmeralda. Dick Sargent, who played the second version of Darren. And Elizabeth Montgomery is what you would now refer to as an ally to the LGBTQ community. I mean, she was even hosting in, in the parades at a lot of the early Pride Fests. The show itself is based around Samantha, who has to keep her true identity hidden. She keeps her broom in the closet so nobody can find out. Now, along the way, I found just as many, if not more, things that would lead you to believe that she was not gay. So here are a few. Agnes was a Christian conservative who only voted Republican. She was very devout in her faith and started every morning by reading scriptures. Every night before bed, she would say a prayer. She was known to always carry a Bible with her everywhere that she went. She had it during her radio broadcasts, the movies, the TV shows. In between sets, she would read scriptures and she would talk with other cast members who were also open and into this, and they would share and do little Bible studies. Now, I'm not saying that by being a Christian conservative, you have to be anti-gay, and Agnes was far from that. She had a personal assistant who was gay for many years, and he says that she was not a lesbian. When Elizabeth Montgomery was asked about this, she said, I never seen any signs or hints that she was. And when Agnes's longtime friend and producer, Paul Gregory, was asked about it, he said, I don't believe it. Her best friend, Debbie Reynolds, wrote an autobiography, and in there she touches on this subject too. She says that she doesn't believe it for one minute. If anybody would have known, it would have been me. Agnes was a workaholic when she wasn't on the set. She was at home studying for the next day and spending hours talking to me on the phone. 
Now, I read some old articles from the late 1960s trying to get some quotes and a better idea of who she was, and here are a couple. When speaking about the youth of today and the world, she says, Permissiveness in society springs from a lack of standards. There must be a rule of behavior and an appreciation of basic values. Materialism has brought about confusion and decadence. I feel sorry for the youth of today. They don't know where to turn. When asked if there will ever be peace and brotherhood in the world, she says, unless the country and the people in it go back to some Christian principles, there will be no peace. We must really care for each other. Just being polite is caring for your fellow man, but these times call for a great deal more than that. When she was asked if legalizing prostitution would make any difference these days, she said, the whole country is lost and loose. So what's the difference? I don't care what anybody else is doing. I just look at whether it's right or wrong and I make my decision. Most people don't do that, but everyone should. When asked about her ex-husband, she said, I would probably still be married to him this day if I hadn't caught him doing what he was doing. So now you know what I know. It's very confusing and contradicting at times, but that's okay. It doesn't matter anyway. Bewitched is a great TV show. Agnes Moorhead was perfect for the part. I only make videos on people that I like or characters that I like. In this case, it's both. I watch these old shows from the 60s at night. They help relax me, ease my anxiety from a stressful day. And I do this channel on occasion because it's my fun time. It's not a job at all. If you enjoyed these videos, please give them a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'll be back with more cool classics.